thank you all for being here. Um, I, I just want to take a moment to expand on Jay's great introduction. I am the horticulturist for Penobscot County. I'm um, one, a part of a team uh, from Cooperative Extension that actually has a statewide presence. So if you're chiming in from other parts of the state, please know um, there are other folks um, that have a position similar to mine um, where we, are, our goal is to help um, support home uh, gardeners, school gardeners, and community gardeners throughout the state of Maine um, with a, a variety of different educational outreach efforts, um, starting with a lot of one-on-one -on -one questions. Uh, so we get all the, the moldy flower pictures and spotted tomato leaves and all those kind of things. Um, this seems to be the year of the Caterpillar ID. Um, so a lot of folks are really paying attention to their landscape and I just, I love the fact that people are, are really zoning in on nature and growing more of their own food and appreciating um, their landscapes in general. So it's, um, it's an unfortunate time and a challenging time, but I think that there um, are a lot of great aspects to it as well in terms of horticulture. Um, so uh, we, we are part of a nationwide cooperative extension system which works through land grant universities in each U.S. state. Um, Maine's land grant university, as you probably know, is in Orono at the University of Maine. And um, in addition to our state offices in Orono, we definitely have a lot of county-based offices. We, it's, um, uh, the Aroostook County has three offices and a few offices, um, a few counties share an office, but um, you can look that right up on our website. Um, and we provide practically a practical local based um, solutions for farmers, small business owners, kids through 4-H, um, parents, consumers, and, and so many others. So please, um, when you have a moment, check out our website. Um, as you may see from the background here, I don't have a chalkboard at home. This is, I actually am um, at my office right now. Um, and, and virtually all of our offices are actually still closed, technically closed, like our doors are closed and locked. We have never closed. Um, so we've all been open through this whole pandemic, um, but we are phys working on um, physically reopening our offices right now. Um, so again, please reach out to the offices through our website, email, even call, um, and we are monitoring those things. Um, but I know that you know if you swing by my office over by the airport um, on Main Avenue, uh, there there won't be anyone here until probably the end of August. But um, we hope to to be open pretty soon for you. Um, this is my other office right now, though, too, um, because of the situation that we're in. Unfortunately, we've had to. Um, not allow any off-site volunteerism um, right now and and normally in normal years this this beautiful demonstration garden is fully planned planted and maintained by a team of volunteers there um, master gardener volunteers and i'll talk a little bit more about what that is in a minute um, but it's it's the the goal of this particular site that you're seeing is um, to demonstrate best practices for home gardeners um, in in our particular climate because um, the context of the climate is really important when you're a gardener um, but it's about 40 to 50 percent edible crops and then uh, uh, again um, 60 to 50 percent um, ornamental crops that are on display um, in this demonstration garden Hopefully next year, just put a note in your calendar to go check out Rogers Farm. Hopefully we'll be open to the public. Right now we are virtually open to the public through things like this, um, this webinar. And we have a pretty active Instagram and Facebook uh, account um, that I try to post pictures of um, as I'm weeding gardens. Um, I actually, confession, I had my, um, I had my video off during a meeting yesterday and I was literally in that L-shaped plot that doesn't have ground cover right now. And it's, it's a combination of a wall of sunflowers and um, shallots and um, scallions and carrots that I'm doing in that particular plot. And I was weeding during a Zoom meeting with my computer. So I have like one of the dirtiest computers ever. But it's, it's the year of you know multitasking right now. It's a very interesting year. Um, so what I'm really excited about though is it's forced me to take a lot of pictures. Um, and this, this presentation hopefully, I think most of the pictures in this um, presentation are either from this week or um, from earlier in the season to show you the progress of, of certain things that I'm gonna talk about in the, in the meat of this presentation. So I do like that aspect. It's kind of forced me to do a better job of record keeping. That first 
um, big blue image of the blueberries was from Tuesday. That's our uh, initial, or I guess it's our second harvest of blueberries. And those went to a local um, uh, low income day daycare right behind our office that we've partnered with in the past um, uh, to help connect uh, fresh produce to neighbors in need that may not have the time or um, transportation resources to get to a food cupboard and also getting past the social stigma of going to a food cupboard. Um, we're bringing the food right to them. And so I was, I was pleased to do my first drop off with them um, earlier this week, which is really great. Um, but those are from some ancient blueberry plants that have witches broom are just um, kind of, they don't look great at all, but it's incredible how much they yield year after year after year. It's so funny um, and, and very rewarding. So um, I feel like I'm probably going to ramble too much, but I, I love Rogers Farm and hopefully, hopefully you can make it out there um, in the near future. Um, one thing that we have been diving into as part of um, the extension team is putting in a lot of resources into our online um, website and our online presence in general. Um, so I just wanted to quickly, because um, we only have an hour, I want you to, to show you um, how to access those resources. Uh, let me see if I can get my, oh shoot, I think I closed out my, Well, I might give you a tour of that website in the in a little bit. Oh, Jay, do you happen to have? Oh, there we go. I'm just looking at the wrong. Bear with me. There we go. There we go. It's just finding out where things are on my computer. Um, so if you have an interest in finding our resources, you can simply put in a search engine, Humane Gardening and it will bring you to likely bring you to our garden and yard website this is what you want to tap into and some of the new resources that we've um, pulled together for gardeners to address the really big increase in interest in gardening are our victory garden for me series and i'm just going to tap on those and Jay's gonna actually um, share some resources with you in the chat and maybe, a, I don't know how you're, you plan to share those in, in later on, um, but th there'll be links there so you don't have to worry about tracking all the URLs. But our Victory Garden for Me um, series is focused on edible crops um, and it goes, takes you from where to begin to actually planning, preparing your soil, planting, managing weeds, watering, um, diagnosing some common problems, and what to do with your harvest. And I think that there are um, either one or two more um, coming in that series. And um, it's not just for beginner gardeners. There's a lot of great information for seasoned gardeners in there as well. And what we've tried to do is keep them to um, segments that are about 15 minutes long. So the team that pulled this together did an incredible job. Um, and I'm finding myself frequently sharing links to specific segments um, to folks that have gardening questions to kind of um, flesh out some of my responses to their questions, which is really great. Um, so check those out, share those with your friends. Um, our main home garden newsletter is something that we've always had. Um, I feel like always it's been it's been going for a long, long time. And um, so I highly recommend subscribing to that. And um, you can look through either the recent issues over here or the archives. And the archives have recently been updated so that you can see the topics that are covered in each particular issue. So this goes back um, several years and you can find out things about um, specific plants, specific techniques that are timely for a certain month. Um, each month has a list of things to do. Um, so if you need to just have a reminder of what might be good things to be working on in your landscape, it's a, it's a great thing um, to, to check and revise. So um, definitely another resource. And we have a gardening mentorship program where we're matching master gardeners with individuals that have questions about specific types of gardening. So if you're starting in with a pollinator garden and just really want someone that has a, a deep knowledge about pollinator plants, um, we can match you with a partner to, to kind of be your guide in that process and be on call through for questions. They're not there to do labor in your garden. They're there as technical support along the way. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a cool new program. Um, great webinar series. So our next one coming up 
is cover crop and soil management. These are free um, with a $5 suggested donation, but again, it's a suggested donation. Um, you can see that we've covered um, webinars on choosing native plants for a pollinator and all season gardening, meaning season extension um, already. Um, and then we've got some uh, other ones coming up later on this month and into September on pain-free gardening, growing garlic, root cellaring. So diving deeper into some topics and I, with some great experts. Um, so, and then uh, our, I'm just going to go into the search it here. Um, Humane Food Preservation webinar series is the same kind of concept um, where they're free, $5 donation um, suggested, but optional. And um, they have steam canning, freezing tomato and corn, canning tomato, salsa and tomatoes. Um, and I believe that they're gonna have some more webinars into the fall as well. So hopefully you've had a great season in your garden um, and can really uh, make the most out of it by preserving or properly storing your foods. Um, going back, I'm just gonna share one more resource. Um, and those are right in our home page. There's a lot to share here. <laughs> um, but if you keep scrolling down here and you have interest in a particular topic, such as berry fruits, for example, um, and you want to dive into having some blue, high bush blueberries and you want to know what varieties work well or how to grow them in Maine, you can click on our bulletins that are available for free and get into all the topics that you would want to know um, for, from selecting and preparing the site, varieties that really work well in Maine. Um, and then one thing that's kind of some people miss is that there's some great videos embedded right into here. So um, one of the really popular ones in late winter is how to prune your blueberries. I won't show you the whole thing, but you can get into um, uh, seeing an expert right there in the field and um, they're showing you exactly how things are done, which is pretty special, I think, and um, responsive to when you need the information, which is sometimes at midnight. You know, we don't have a webinar going on at midnight, but you can check out our YouTube video on it. Um, so those are some, uh, a quick orientation to some of our resources. And I'm going to try to toggle back into, did you, did you hear any audio with that video, by the way? I think I need to reshare my screen. Um, I it has audio. I don't think I did. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment. Come back this to is, it. Yeah, this is the, um, the nature of Zoom is you have to kind of work through some publicly work through some technical <laughs> stuff here, but I think we should be good now. I'm just very impressed with those of you who are on camera with pens and pencils in hand taking notes. That yeah. is awesome. <laughs> and now I feel like I need to do the same. So, well, the nice thing about this is it's recorded, which is good. <laughs> that is true. That is true. So, um, I think I went through most of these. Um, at I, Jay, I'll share with you my Facebook and Instagram links if I haven't already. Just remind me to do that. Um, yes. And then those can go out to folks as well. Um, the Master Gardener Volunteers, if you really want to dive deep um, and join a great community of, of folks that love plants, um, I highly encourage you to consider that. It's a more, it's a bigger commitment. So it's about a 50 hour training um, where you normally it's in class and um, hopefully we'll be able to do some, some in-person stuff in the near future. Um, it's a weekly thing where it starts in the end of February and goes in through May. And then we pick back up in September for four classes as well. And it's a train the trainer program where we uh, basically provide really in-depth research-based information to a troop of folks that are um, committed to bringing it out to the public through educational volunteer work or food security um, volunteer work. And they put in thousands of hours every year. It's incredible what they do. Um, and so it's a, it's a really powerful program, a really wonderful community. And folks can um, contact me directly if you'd like to be notified when the details of the next program are offered. Um, 
And we also have a pollinator garden certification program coming up um, very soon. And our brand new program, Virtual Demonstration Garden, um, just got profiled on the news actually last night, which was great. Um, we're crowdsourcing photos. So if you've got a great garden going on right now, please take some pictures and consider sharing them um, with us uh, because there's so much knowledge and creativity in our um, main gardening team. Um, I'm just realizing, oops, uh, that I might have, are you seeing your Zoom right in front of my slide? Any chance? Uh, yeah, and I can see I, the view that we have, we can see the next slide. And can then, you see the Zoom? Oh, can you see the Zoom, like your faces in front mm, of it though? No, no. Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, the virtual demonstration garden is, is something that we're, we're currently pulling, um, requesting gardeners to send in photos, and then we're going to sort through them and put them online um, on our website, on our um, Instagram page, and on our Facebook page. So it'll be kind of like Pinterest for gardeners um, so that you can um, be inspired by each other and help um, educate other gardeners. So now I'm going to dive in with all that said, sorry for the long introduction, to some um, footage from, from Roger's Farm about things that we're, uh, that I, we, I keep saying we, that I'm doing at Roger's Farm. Um, I'm a little lonely there right now, so I pretend I'm with someone else. <laughs> um, and this is one thing that I did early in the season. Um, instead of having a beautiful ornamental plot in this, in this particular section of the garden, um, I couldn't commit to keeping up with the annuals and I really wanted to make sure we were growing food for um, the area food cupboards and um, other food security partners. So I planted a lot of tomatoes. I think overall in this plot and a few other plots, we've got about 100 tomato plants. Um, and I did this and I set them up in a row and the easiest way to keep tomato plants upright and healthy and easy to harvest from is, is this basket weaving method. And it's great for um, both um, indeterminate and determinate plants, you know, the vining ones and the bush type ones. You can do it with both of them. And basically what I did at the beginning was use a short piece of um, white PVC and um, put the string through the PVC and the PVC helps me guide that string in between the plants. Um, and it helps basically create a wall of tomatoes. And each week you need to go through, pretty much each week, um, and go through and add another layer of twine as the plants get taller. Um, but it's incredible how much easier it is um, than using a tomato cage. I absolutely despise using tomato cages. <laughs> no matter what, I'd say about 90% of the varieties of tomatoes um, that we have are, um, I'm gonna pause this just for a sec, uh, outgrow tomato cages. Um, and, and so not only are you getting something that is gonna be flopping over the edge of the tomato cages, but it's gonna be hard to get in and see everything that needs to be harvested. Your plants end up really dense, so the foliage doesn't dry out. And then that promotes um, fungal diseases from, uh, you know, it helps them proliferate and become a problem too. So you want, good airflow in your plants and be able to see um, your plants to be able to harvest in um, pretty easily. So I really, really like this technique. It doesn't work for everyone's situation, but you can do this with as few as four, three or four plants in a smaller setting garden. garden. So if you're not doing 100 plants, that's fine. Um, all you need is a four to five foot stake in, um, and space it again, um, it, uh, every three to four plants, a stake um, between every three to four plants. So um, in addition to doing that basket weave, every week I'm going in and um, I am cleaning up the plants, meaning removing some of the lower leaves that um, may not be as necessary and kind of crowding things out and make it harder to see in the, in the plant canopy. But I'm more importantly, pinching out the suckers. So um, those lower leaves that are below the flower cluster are actually not really, um, they're photosynthesizing, but they're not putting a lot of resources into the fruit development. They're, they're putting important resources into the root development. But once they get more leaves further up on the canopy, I, canopy, um, I usually uh, thin those out as well. But what I'm doing here is pinching out the suckers. Each one of those little growths in the axis of the leaves 
um, are, could potentially, if left unchecked, become a stem in itself. And it's tempting to let your plants grow big and thick and produce lots of growth, but you're sacrificing um, fruit production when you put in your plant puts out a lot of vegetative production. So um, in theory, the, one of the better ways to do it is to, to encourage your plants to have one to two main stems um, that they're producing fruit off of, and that'll help you produce um, fewer, fewer fruit, but higher quality fruit that are gonna ripen in time as well. Um, it's not so much essential with your um, determinate ones, the bush type tomatoes, but um, it's helpful with the indeterminate ones. And, and I, I, some of it does get ahead of me, but um, it, it is helpful, especially when you look at things right now. Um, so I'm just pointing out here that uh, I leave the sucker that's just below the first flower cluster, and that'll be my other stem, my main stem. And so you get tomato hands as you do this. I'm sure you probably, if you've ever pinched off leaves and suckers on tomatoes, and this is what it looks like great. Um, this is on Tuesday. So you can see the layers of um, basket weaves that I've done, and we've got um, I think five rows like this right now um, that I've tried to keep up with. And also being in this spot has helped me um, monitor for tobacco hornworm, which is a devastating insect and, and pretty gruesome looking insect um, that chickens love, but I don't love. They, they eat the foliage and they eat the fruit and um, create a big mess around the plants. So, uh, and Again, I'm just getting my eyes used to these things. <laughs> um, so another thing to consider doing is testing your soil. This isn't a soils um, program, but I just want to introduce the concept. Um, and um, we have a great video on how to actually do it. One of the key things that I always tell people when I'm giving out their first soil test kit is um, your soil test report that you're going to get back has really, really good information, but it's only going to be the information is only gonna be as good as the sample that you bring in. So um, don't just run out to your garden and grab one little shovel full and put it in the box and send it in. You're gonna to wanna to get a representative sample of the garden. And that means on an average size vegetable garden, say it's a 50 by 50 or 30 by 50 garden, um, you go out and you get about a dozen different samples from throughout the garden. Mix them up in a bucket or a, a clean bag, not a metal bucket, but a clean plastic bucket. Um, and then fill your box with a subsample from that mixture. And this is what you get for a report. Um, it's a little complicated, but um, I'm happy to go over your report with you and help you um, determine what you do need to do for next steps. It provides you with really important chemical information about your pH, um, your nutrient levels, um, also your organic matter, matter levels, and very importantly, not pictured here, is whether you have lead in the soil. It'll tell you whether there's any concern with lead, which is a human health concern. Um, so Again, soil testing can be done any time of year, as long as the soil's not frozen. I actually have gotten some samples in January where people have just, they wanna get it done, they go dig through the soil, and they, they dig through the snow and get their pickaxe out and they do get some samples, which is valid, but a lot easier to do it now. Um, and again, it provides you with really um, applied information on what to do for next steps to bring things up to optimal conditions for the crops that you're gonna be growing. And it's good for lawns too, if you're struggling with lawn issues, um, this is this is one of the first steps I recommend for any lawn issue is figuring out how to optimize your soil conditions for turf, um, which t lawn issues are common right now. <coughs> Excuse me, that was loud. Um, one of the things that a lot of folks learn the hard way this year is um, that it's it's important to consider. Um, planting a little bit later. Don't rush the season by planting too early. It was, it's been a hard year in many ways, but it was hard for a lot of gardeners because they um, got hit by the late spring frost. And really, unless you're a commercial grower trying to beat your competition to the market, or you have a lot of extra seedlings and plenty of spare time to replant, it's not worth putting things out there too soon. Um, I put in late in quotes because I don't consider planting tomatoes in early June as late. A lot of folks really want to get their tomatoes in the ground mid to late um, 
May, even as we saw this, even in late May, we can get a hard killing frost or a frost that will set things back and um, may set things back enough that they don't really fully recover and they end up being um, less uh, thrifty plants in the, in the long run. So we have a great resource on our website, a planting chart for the home vegetable garden. And I just got a screenshot of part of it um, that shows in that last column, planting date for central Maine which surprises a lot of folks in the range of dates that you have to work with. Look at that August 1st date for beets. How many of you actually plant your beets in August 1st? <laughs> I just did actually at Rogers Farm and I've got, I'm looking forward to a, a great fall crop um, that we can provide to um, our food security partners at a time when they don't get as many fresh produce donations. I am also still part of the group that's giving out squash, summer squash and zucchini, just like everyone else right now. But um, I try to really think about my efforts in the context of what our food security partners are getting when they're getting a lot and when they need it most, which is usually on the shoulder season. So, um, and planting late also means, you know, extending that season. Um, and using simple temperature control strategies. So we've got some great videos on how to build raised beds that have little hoops over them. You can use those same hoop ideas in the ground as well and, and create um, mini low tunnels. And those can help you extend your season weeks and weeks um, for a lot of different crops. So I, I highly encourage trying that and trying that before you go and dive into getting a greenhouse, honestly. Um, I feel like in my observations with a lot of home gardeners, um, I've, it feels like greenhouses are a lot like puppies. They seem like a really great idea and um, are fun at first, but then they end up being um, expensive <laughs> and uh, maybe higher maintenance than people expect. And, um, and not as, you know, not as fitting for, for people's lives in the long run, whereas you know, creating a little hoop out of wire wickets that are left over from a political campaign, for example, or I use um, small sections of rebar on either side of my rows. I wish I had a picture handy for it, but like a 18 inch section of rebar. And I put one on one side of the row and one on the other side of the row. And then I use a flexible um, well pipe, um, usually like a three quarter inch um, black pipe that you can get at any hardware store. And I, anchor that on either side with the, um, um, the rebar. And um, that creates a very easy hoop. You don't have to have a bender to bend that hoop. Um, and you could take it apart really easily and it stores really easily. And then I use that to put row cover or plastic over that area. And that's my mini greenhouse. And it's easy to do and very, very inexpensive. Um, so um, one of the things that a common challenge that a lot of folks have when they're um, planting carrots is that they have really poor germination because their carrot seeds dry out or they plant their seeds too deeply and they're just, it is a, a pretty small and um, quite frankly, wimpy seed. Um, and so it is important to treat that seed really um, a certain way. And it's not rocket science, but it's just, there are some good practices to keep um, it from drying out or be, being planted too deeply. Um, so this is kind of what we've been doing this year. We may, um, on May 26th, I went ahead and I was um, in a hurry uh, as I am with a lot of projects at Rogers Farm. So this time I just scattered um, the seeds over the plot and then put chopped straw on top of that. I didn't, I wasn't really mindful as to spreading out the seeds, doing them in rows or anything like that. I just was like, here you go. <laughs> and I put the chopped straw on top of it, which is basically just what you would think it would be is, is um, a straw, but it's cut up into pieces. So it's not too matted and too thick. And then I put row cover over it. That's the spun bound um, cloth, lightweight cloth. It's, I, I use for a lot of different types of things, um, mainly for insect protection. But I put that on there and then um, watered it in. Water goes right through that row cover. And then um, about 10 days later, I go in and check it. And that helps keep the moisture in too. Um, and this is what it looked like. We had good germination, really dense germination. You could go in and you're supposed to thin 
things out um, at that point in time. I didn't get around to thinning it out as much as I should have. Um, but around later on that month, I started to think about um, the next crop of carrots that I wanted to plant. And I was having a relaxing moment uh, with a friend at our picnic table and um, decided that I would uh, multitask and visit with a friend and um, teach her how to do carrot seed tape <laughs> so that I could, in my next round, properly space them. And this is something you can easily do using stuff that you have in your own home. It's um, an equal parts mix of flour and water. So usually I just do one tablespoon flour, one tablespoon water, mix that up and makes a paste. Um, and then you dot that paste on the precious toilet paper that you have around. It's not as precious now <laughs> as it was before. Um, and you put it according to the spacing that you want that crop. You can do this with any small seeded crop, but it's great for carrots in particular. Um, and you can see that we put about three seeds on each dot. It was older seed, so I, I, I sewed it on the seed tape a little bit thicker. Um, you can go and do it one seed at a time, but honestly, we were just in a rush and wanted to do it quickly while our kids were happy. Um, and so uh, I did that, let it dry, and then you can go ahead and plant that in the garden um, when you're ready later on. And, and it can store in the refrigerator just like you would your seeds until you're ready to go ahead and plant. Um, and then, so shortly after that, June 28th, July 17th, well, it wasn't that shortly after, I sowed the other crop. Um, and I plan to harvest that one in early October. Again, I used row cover over that. I put boards over a couple spots, a couple rows. Um, to keep, boards are another way to keep um, it moist. This is harvesting the first crop earlier this week. And I've got it prepped. And that was my first donation to the, uh, the local daycare. So, and I'm realizing I'm gonna quickly run out of time. <laughs> uh, <there it> is. <clears throat> no so rush. <laughs> here's uh, <laughs> hopefully I'm not talking too quickly too, but I just like showing some of these fun tricks. Um, I got a wonderful donation of um, seedlings from Hutchings Greenhouse at the end of the season, end of, the, end of their season. And one of the things that they do a great job is growing beautiful basil. Um, and they're very generous in their basil plants because they have multiple plants right in the same pot. <clears throat> and you really don't wanna plant something just as in like that. What you wanna do is thin it out. And um, what I did was I cut off the top here. Let's see if I can pause that. <clears throat> not to um, encourage branching of that basil plant. And I'm pointing out that each one of those side shoots right there is going to um, produce another full stem. And you can keep pinching that so you get a much more dense plant. Um, but I'm not wasting what I just cut off there. Basil roots really, really easily. And so I'm gonna plant this mother plant in the ground and um, then I didn't, I didn't edit this very well, but it's, it, you know, I'm just chunking them right in the ground. <laughs> I didn't even remove the leaves. Um, I just plop them in. I did this on a rainy or drizzly day and knowing that there was gonna be some rain um, for a couple consecutive days after this. So it was um, pretty low stress on the plant material itself. And I'm, I worked the soil so it's nice and loose, easy to work in. Um, and then, full confession, I neglected them terribly for <laughs> the rest of the season. So just before I took this picture, I weeded them for the first time after doing that. Because <laughs> um, we all get busy in the garden. Um, so this is what it looks like after being neglected. I never watered them, surprisingly. Um, so this was after we got past the really bad dry period at the beginning of the season, but it was still relatively dry um, for the remainder of when these got in the ground. Um, and they still forgave me for it. And I'll just show you, I actually plopped in one of the suckers of the tomato plants um, that I let get overgrown too. And suckers red, root red, really readily too. Um, so if you wanna propagate your tomato plants um, and see if you can get some more out of them, that's another way of doing it. Um, and that's a little tour of that. 
and you can kind of see along the margins there how weedy it was. <laughs> um, everyone has weeds. So hopefully you can just make the most out of your plants. So that was just, you know, one plant pot of basil that you could get so many um, young plantlets off of. And I'm sure if I had watered regularly, pinched those um, new propagules, they would have been much bushier and um, more prolific in the long run. Um, the biggest challenge of this is to figure out where, <laughs> where my mouse is. There we go. Uh, cover crops. As I mentioned before, there's a webinar on this and it's a big topic, but I'll show you the quick and dirty of what we did or we I did um, at Rogers Farm this year because unfortunately I could not plant as much as I, I would like to have. Um, I only have about four hours of time there at the farm um, in my plan of work right now because I've got a lot of other projects that I'm doing. Um, but so I had to do cover crop on some of the real estate there. Um, so to do that, I started off the season, oops, find my mouse again, um, in this case with um, peas and oats as my first cover crop. There's a lot of different crops that work well to cover a space. And the goal is to um, basically reduce the weed seed pressure. There's a whole bunch of weeds in that soil as from historical um, activities where you know seeds may weeds may have gone to seed and just dropped their seed in the seeds on uh, a lot of varieties of weeds um, most species can last um, for uh, to up to 30 to 40 years um, in your soil resting waiting for the right conditions to germinate so if you have those right conditions which is an empty plot that doesn't have other things growing in it then it can get really out of hand so you want to be intentional about trying to grow something when you need to give a plot a rust. Um, and so I really like oats and peas because um, they are quick growing, very hardy in the in the early season. Um, you can sow them in like mid to late May and they, they germinate pretty readily. Um, and peas, as many of you probably know, are a legume and it's they're they're a nitrogen fixer, meaning they take atmospheric nitrogen and put it into a form that's more usable for um, plants. And that actually happens when the plant material is breaking down in the soil. So um, at the end of the season, when the crop, cover crop is um, actually incorporated in the soil and that crop starts to break down, the nitrogen's released for the next crop to grow even better. Um, so initially it was during the dry period. So I did put the water to it for the first week or so. Um, and it took a lot of water to try to get it wet, in, you know, wet in and, and whatnot. I did rake it into, but I, I show those first two videos just to show that you don't have to like do a lot to really actually plant the seed. You can scatter it like you're feeding your chickens and you just, ideally you want to rake it in so it has better contact with the soil, but you can even just leave it on top of the soil and it probably will germinate and get established just fine too. If you have really hard pack soil um, and get a heavy rain, sometimes that seed can get washed off. So again, that's why raking, or even if you've got a roller, rolling it to get it, have good contact with the soil is, is a good idea to do. Um, I say water or not because I stopped watering. I didn't have time to get that out every time. Um, and so again, mother nature will probably help you out with that enough for it to germinate. And then once it's germinated, it develops a root system pretty quick. And these are um, what grows up. This is peas and oats. And I show you this because it's pointing out that they don't have flowers yet, um, but they will, once they start flowering um, and developing um, seed head, um, then I go ahead and I have Farmer Joe, who has the mechanical device um, to um, mow and incorporate it into the garden. You can do this with a hand tiller or your, your lawnmower, you can just mow it down. Um, some people, depending on the time of year when that cover crop is done, um, actually just simply plant in the remains of the cover crop. So they mow it down so it's killed off and then um, they leave it for about a week so it dries up. And then you can just you know, dig a hole where you want to put your transplants and that debris will actually serve as a mulch. Um, 
uh, for the plants that you're putting in around in there. Or you can um, make a trench and put your direct seeded crops in there and the debris from that initial cover crop will serve as a mulch around those carrot seeds, for example. Um, so you can go that route. That's a little bit better soil health wise to not till. Um, but for practical reasons I won't get into, I had to till in this case. Um, so that's mid season. Then what do we do? We've got an empty, pal empty pallet and planting another cover crop. Uh, this time I'm using buckwheat. Uh, this one has another benefit. It's a little bit different. This particular plant has allelopathic uh, characteristics, which is a really fun horticultural term. Um, basically, it puts out chemical inhibitors that inhibit um, other seeds from germinating, which is good for this purpose, um, where you're trying to keep uh, other weed seeds from germinating. Um, and there's been some um, discussion of it also being good for managing a quack grass. I don't know how fully valid that is. We have a big quack grass problem. That's a, a weed that spreads through rhizomes. Um, but it, you know, whatever I can do to help manage that too at the same time. Um, same applies um, with it going to seed. I don't want it to go to seed, but I do want it to flower because it's really, really great for the bees. And especially if you have a big chunk of it, even the 10 by 10 square of it is a great, great oasis for pollinators. And you wouldn't believe the diversity of bees that you see on this particular plant. Um, in Maine, we have over 200 different species of bees, native bees, um, and it's incredible to just stand there in front of a, a plot of flowering buckwheat or any other um, pollinator plant, like anything in the mint family right now is really just fun to um, sit in front of and watch and, and see that uh, diversity and that activity. Um, I just put in a funny post on our Instagram page, at least it's funny from my opinion, um, <laughs> of a calendar that shows reminders every single day of checking your beans, checking your cucumbers, checking your zucchini, checking your summer squash. Um, because um, if you lose track of your harvest, um, another big trick and tip is to um, keep up with that harvest because if you lose track of it, um, your plants will actually slow down. Um, overripe plants, uh, overripe fruit on your plants will send a signal to the plant that they're they're done doing what they're they're meant to do, which is to reproduce. Um, and um, then you'll get a, a smaller crop over at that plant. So this is your reminder when you're done this webinar to go out to your garden, check your beans, check your cucumbers, check your squash, and and keep up with that harvest. And you probably all encountered that that zombie, you know zucchini that's like the size of a baseball bat that's just overwhelming it, it can happen really fast surprisingly fast you think i checked my garden yesterday well it's it can happen overnight <laughs> especially if we get rains um onions uh, i love growing storage onions and they're a great crop for harvest for hunger because uh, most people know how to use it are comfortable with using this type of fresh produce um, and it has a good shelf life, um, especially the storage onions. So I like um, Patterson and Copra are my two favorite, you know, white um, storage onions. There's a lot of great ones on the market, but those two seem to be good performers. Again, these were neglected. These were planted um, again during a Zoom meeting <laughs> in my computer right nearby. And I planted actually these in trios um, it was just a space saving technique and, and I, I actually like that when weeding it's a little bit easier to weed around groupings of plants and um, when you plant the three um, onion seedlings together um, they're not overcrowded because they each have individually have space around themselves to expand out and size up. They may not be as fully sized as you would when you plant singles but it's easier to weed around those groupings. Um, and a lot of commercial growers go that route. So I noticed that these earlier this week had already flopped over and that's your indicator that they're ready to harvest and cure um, for storage. And um, curing is a concept that not everyone is familiar with when they go into gardening. And that's basically just a, um, a final prep um, right after harvest to dry them out and make sure that they are um, op optimal conditions for storage, long-term storage. And this has been a great week actually to do this. Yesterday I pulled them up 
laid them on top of the ground, and I'm gonna leave them until I get back to the farm on Tuesday. Um, and um, I don't expect any rain between now and then, knock on wood. And so they have great conditions to just dry out. And then once they're um, dried out, I will clip them about one inch, um, give them a one inch neck, and then um, store them in a cool, um, dark location and around uh, um, close to spring, actually, if you can. Right now, that's hard to find, but you know, whatever is the coolest part and darkest part of your your house is a great spot. And I was enjoying these one year. I had them right up until the end of June. Um, they were holding their own pretty well in the storage conditions that I had. And when they were starting to go, like get a little bit softer. I chop them up and I put them in the freezer too. Onions freeze really, really well. Um, so I pretty much had back to back fresh onions um, one year and it was really a great experience. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm gonna, maybe I have fodder for a future gardening um, series. Uh, <laughs> Jay, <laughs> make your smile there. Um, Cause I have a few more slides, but I, I wanna give some time for some questions as well. So I'll stop talking. Okay, there's a bunch of questions uh, in the chat. And I'm actually just gonna let people speak up on their own. So if you dropped a question in the chat, feel free to speak up and, um, and share it now so that we can all hear it. Guess I'll go first. <laughs> um, when, when is the best time to do a soil test so that you can get your soil proper for growing vegetables? So don't let this stop you if you find out that you want to do a soil test in the spring. That's absolutely fine. There's no real, real best time, but I would say fall is a, a good time to do it um, okay. because then if you need to do any adjustments, you can, especially the pH, um, if you need to add lime, for example, to increase your pH. Um, in, a pH adjustments can take um, two to three months sometimes. Um, to really chemically happen in your soil. And so you can put that down in the fall and, you know, have that magic happen over the winter time. And um, so the sooner you do it, the better, no matter what. Okay. Um, and then applying the other amendments like nutrients, um, just keep in mind that you'll want to apply the nitrogen, any nitrogen recommendations um, while plants are actively growing, but not too late in the season too. Um, so you, I don't know if it came up on my basket weaving thing, but um, be sure not to over fertilize things um, this time of year, especially because you can end up with a lot of leafy, fleshy growth. For perennial plants, they don't harden off in time. Um, for the winter time and for um, plants like tomatoes and peppers, you end up getting a lot of leaves and not a lot of fruit. Right, right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Kate, what type of uh, black piping did you say you used for the frames? Uh, I refer to it as well pipe. I think there's some other trade names for it, but it comes in like, you know, 100 foot lengths or even smaller lengths, I think, um, at local hardware stores. And it's three quarter inch. I think you can use half inch. You can use PVC to actually make those hoops as well, P just regular um, thinner white PVC um, lengths that you can cut and make. Are thinner white PVC lengths flexible enough to bend? Surprisingly so. So if you look at you mean um, the you mean season extension video, if you search you mean season extension video, there's a four part video series and they actually use that for the hoops on the raised beds. They use like a, a C clamp um, that they anchor to the side of the bed and then they feed it through that C clamp on the side of the bed. It's pretty, pretty nifty. I have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned you putting buckwheat down as a cover crop because it inhibits other seeds. And if that's an area where you want to plant things that will grow the following year, will it inhibit them? You're paying attention, Diane. Yes, I, <laughs> I think I kind of hinted a little bit. It's a good thing for that. Um, when you're done your cover crop um, of buckwheat, when it, you know right after it's in full flower, you mow it down. You can incorporate it in. You can just leave it as a top, you know, layer of debris. And then you want to wait if you're direct seeding something. Um, usually I found um, it's, I think, about a couple weeks. 
um, depending on the temperature and um, the moisture uh -huh. conditions. I don't know really the science behind how long that um, in inhibitor lingers in the soil beyond that. I could look it up if you'd like, but um, I, Personally, I had the experience last year where I did buckwheat first and I, and I did, I sometimes do buckwheat as an early cover crop and that's perfectly fine too. Um, but then I followed it with oats and I, I seeded my oats a little too soon um, <laughs> afterwards um, and it, they didn't germinate very well. Uh -huh. at all. Okay. Um, so that those allelopathic characteristics don't know intentional crops versus unintentional crops such as weeds um, and they don't discriminate against them um, so i i ended up having to re-sow my oats a couple weeks later and they came okay. out just fine but it doesn't last a couple years it just lasts a couple weeks okay correct and my Good other question. question is my other question is somebody told me i should not let my tomato plants get too tall sometimes they get t way taller than me and they said that it wouldn't produce as good a fruit if i let it get too tall i should keep it what do you think about that like um, it's more important, and more important to thin them so they don't grow too thick uh -huh. than the height. Um, uh -huh. Actually, tomatoes, interestingly enough, if grown in the right environment, are a perennial plant. Uh -huh. um, they're a tropical plant, and they'll just keep growing and growing and growing. But we have a limited time to work with them here because of our temperature. Um, and so if you've got a vining one, though, I mean, there's been some impressive pictures that I've seen that you know, they'll grow. 20 to 40 feet tall and if you're ever lucky enough to tour the backyard farms facility in Madison you can see that they use scissor lifts actually to raise their employees up to harvest higher in the oh community. It's, it's pretty fascinating okay. actually. So it's no problem to let them get as tall as they want. Yes, to. sorry it right. was very good, indirect long-winded answer. <laughs> I'm glad I asked, okay. I'd like to, oh, sorry, uh, I'd like to jump off a couple of the points that uh, uh, I believe Diane just brought up. Um, so that uh, that tomato plant um, having perennial capabilities um, is is that something where if you're uh, bringing it indoors that you can fake it into having that capability to be yeah. perennial? Um, and earlier I had wondered about a basil having that capability as well. Much easier with basil and non-fruiting crops than with fruiting crops. Um, so mm -hmm. great question. So with fruiting crops and, and tomato is a fruit um, and, and I teach my kids um, a, a fruit is a suitcase for seeds. So if you're eating anything that has seeds in it, it's mm -hmm. a fruit. So cucumbers are fruit, pumpkins are fruit. That's my botanical. Yeah, seed. horticulture. Um, but, <laughs> exactly. Um, but with um, any fruit and crops, they require a lot more energy to produce that fruit, as you would expect. And so um, light is, is the limiting factor um, in indoors. And um, so if you can provide sufficient light, you can right. probably get some fruit. Mm -hmm. I Actually, there was a um, a 90 year old master gardener that used to um, send me cucumbers in January from up in Millinocket. Um, he used to hand deliver them and then he eventually stopped driving and he, he mailed them one year. It was so adorable. Um, but you can do fruit and crops indoors with sufficient light. Um, and, uh, but with basil, it's not producing a fruit. It's a leafy green and um, you can keep those as, in as much a light as possible though. Still, they, they will thrive better um, in, in, highlight conditions. Mm -hmm. With tomatoes, you also want to play Cupid and be the one that is the, the bee. Yes, pollinating. Yeah, and you yes. can use, like, um, you can kind of knock it with your hands. It's a little bit better um, to use like a electric um, toothbrush, actually. Uh, they, tomato growers actually have um, tools that uh, do the same thing as bees, which is like sonicate the flowers. They vibrate it so that the pollen um, falls in, onto the flower. But um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of neat. Lovely. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the master gardening um, uh, program. I certainly, um, sorry, I'm, I'm very new to all of these processes. So I have been very prolific in my questioning in the chat and just in the, the, areas that I want to discover more knowledge, but uh, it sounded like that master gardening program was something where you're, um, you know, experiencing knowledge from, from the individuals specifically, but is, is there also um, permaculture resources and, um, you know, those, those perennial 
food guild resources available through actual individuals actually having success with these processes? Like a, like a mentor that has experience with more permaculture type practices? Is yeah. that what you're thinking of? Yeah. yeah. There are definitely so some master gardeners. Perennials and, you know, uh, local plants and such. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are some folks that do a lot more with natives than others. Yeah. So usually when I put get a request from the master for the a master gardener mentor, um, in that form, you'll indicate what kind of gardening interests okay. you have. And then I will think in about our pool and the skill sets of our different master gardeners and um, reach out directly to someone that I think it will be a good match for you. We'll be, we have a partially shaded uh, area and uh, I have a raised bed. Uh, for some reason, the our zucchini has really huge uh, uh, leaves, but the fruiting is very slow. That's that's definitely the case with uh, light. Light can be an issue outdoors for sure with fruiting crops. Um, and I actually wrote an article in the Maine Home Garden News all about that because um, my one of my first vegetable gardening adventures was um, in a highly shaded spot. And I actually did rooftop container gardens because I was just trying to get the most sunlight for those things. So um, fruiting crops and again anything that has seeds um, should have between at least six hours but any ideally um, at least eight hours of sunlight um, for really good pretty good production and, and the intensity of the sunlight um, really is important too so you don't want dappled sunlight if it's just morning sunlight then it's not as um, valuable as midday to afternoon sunlight where you're going to get more intense so that's probably why you're seeing a lot more leaf production and leaves in general um, morphology of leaves they tend to be thinner and bigger in less light so you'll see that with native plants even you look at trees um, and, and trees growing in shade uh, I think of moose maple or striped maple. Those have really big, big leaves. But if you see that plant growing in a sunnier site, they'll have smaller, um, thicker leaves. Um, and it's just a strategy to capture more light. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good explanation. Because actually my other plot, which is an open field, worse, looks worse, but has more fruit than the one I have. So it, it's the shading then. Okay, that's good. Yeah, thing. yeah. Hey, speaking of leaves, we have to. But thank yes. you so much for the uh, for the session. It's been really great. Yeah, no, no, no problem with that. But I, I still would have fruit, though, right? Uh, in the, in the shaded spot or in the in the sunny spot? In shaded plot, because my my full sun plot looks terrible, but more more fruit than my shaded uh, plant that look wonderful. In so the I still could have bare fruit. I still could bear fruit in a partly shaded. Uh, um, yeah, it, possibly um, it would it would be definitely limited. So I usually recommend um, using that shade as an asset to grow leafy crops like your spinach and your lettuce and things that actually the flavor is um, diminished or um, what's the other word I'm looking for? It's not as great um, when it's grown in hot sunny um, conditions. Take that as a as a good spot to grow your leafy greens. Basil actually grows really well in that four to six um, hour of sunlight um, range as well. Thank grows you. better in the full sun, but <laughs> yeah. Do potatoes need full sun? They do. They do, and they're not. Um, considered a fruiting fruiting crop although I always get the question every year what are those little green things on the tomatoes those are the actual true fruit of the the um I said tomatoes potatoes um they are a, a close relative of the tomatoes so if you look at the fruit you can see why um but yeah they do perform better in full sun they'll, they'll produce a few tubers and um and that might be just what you need. Is that just that fresh pick and that experience of picking something out of the garden? Yeah. Um, but if you're looking okay. for production, full sun. Okay, thanks. This maybe has been one, great information. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, maybe one more question, just to give everyone a graceful way of getting out. <laughs> this is Fran. I have a, a question about raised beds. I belong to the community garden in Bangor, one of them. And should I put a cover crop on that, Kate, at the end of the season or let it be clean? 
Well, if you're, um, if you've got some empty spots right now, this is a really, really good time to sow oats. Um, and that would be the cover crop that I would choose this time of year because oats actually have some um, cool tolerance. Um, I, I said uh, buckwheat um, because I sowed that about a week ago um, uh, for, for right now. But if you're, if you've got a, a lag of a couple days where you got to go and find the oats and, um, and find the seed and then sow the seed maybe next week, then I would go with that instead of buckwheat because it was, this is kind of pushing the end of the window of when you would want to plant buckwheat. But oats reliably get killed off over the winter time. So you don't have them haunting you like um, winter rye. Winter rye can come back every year. Oops. Get a little bit of feedback. Um, winter rye can come back and you have to kill it off or till it in next year, but oats will be um, just basically resting on top of the soil and as a mulch for next season. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you and thank, thank all of you for the great question. So, um, I think Jay might have my email address and could send that out to folks or maybe post it somewhere. Um, and I welcome your questions anytime. Well, I just want to offer, Kate, if, if you're able to stay on a few more minutes, I think other folks have questions. Is that okay? Yeah, I could stay on for about 10 minutes. I have to re return a couple call questions that are, I've got to get to but um yeah. okay let's take let's yeah. take maybe one or two more questions uh really gonna, gonna squeeze what we can out of you um <laughs> so if folks have a few other questions let's get those going so I just wanted to pop back to leaves um you specifically had mentioned pruning tomato leaves um so that obviously your uh, nutrients are able to go to different parts of the plant um, beneficially. Is that something that is across the board, every plant can benefit from different types of pruning so that uh, you're, you're really encouraging the types of growth that you need? Um, not across the board. That's a great mm -hmm. question. Um, a lot of our woody crops, so, um, and, and even uh, our woody ornamentals um, can benefit from uh, pruning, some more than regularly than others. So things like your raspberries and blackberries um, should be pruned annually. Um, your blueberries should be at least um, checked High bush blueberries should be checked um, at least every couple years. Your fruit trees um, should be pruned or checked every every year. Um, so those are all really important ones to keep up with the pruning. But for herbaceous things, meaning that things that die back to the ground at the end of the growing season, um, tomatoes are the key one that I can think of right off the top of my head. But most other things you don't really need to actively, you know, tidy throughout the season. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna think of like five things after we get mm -hmm. off the Zoom that should be pruned. But <laughs> yeah, I've 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 sort of naturally started removing anything that's been chewed from pests or you know browning from lack of, of nutrient. Um, but other than that, just let them be. Yeah, I mean, if you see disease symptoms, um, that's another important thing to consider. And it depends on the disease, but um, if you are collecting anything that looks like it has a fungal pathogen or bacteria or something like that, one, one key thing is to um, have a bag handy and make sure that you put it directly in the bag instead of walking through the garden. So if you have like early blight or septoria and you're pruning those out or even late blight and you're trying to clean up your plants, Walking through the garden with diseased tissue will help that, that fungal pathogen to, to spread throughout the garden. So just making sure you have good sanitation practices is re really important as you're cleaning things up. Certainly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good questions, Anastasia. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, I'm going to call you out because I saw your question in the chat, and I'm actually interested in Kate's thoughts on this. Do you want to ask it? Is it the one about no-till and low-till gardening? Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm interested in that concept, but other traditional gardeners I talk to are horrified at the thought. So I wondered what your thoughts are on that. 
I really like that question. And I am more of a um, no-till gardener as much as possible. This is this has been the year of all these exceptions because I've had to do what I had to do. Um, but let me see if I can jump ahead. This is um, a really good um, visual. Can Oh, I'm not showing you my screen, am I? No. <laughs> let me see if I can share this. Okay. Can you see that picture? Yes. It's like a Martha Stewart garden. That's not, I can't take credit for that. That's one of our wonderful master gardeners um, and her team. And they um, established a very well-designed garden that basically is not constructed raised beds, but um, just hilled beds that are wide. Um, so these are about three to three and a half feet wide beds. Um, with uh, dedicated walkways. So um, compaction is one of the reasons why a lot of times people need to till. Um, but if you're making sure that you're only walking in certain areas of the garden, our foot traffic is the worst compaction. Our plants won't compact the soil. It's us that compacts the soil. So if you can avoid that compaction and um, have kind of some hilled up areas where you're planting, um, you can get away with no-till gardening. Um, it also depends on the characteristics of your soil. I mean, if you have really awful soil, which in a lot of places in Maine we do, unfortunately, you're going to have to work to get that friability out of your soil by adding in organic matter over a period of time. Um, and again, not compacting over a period of time. And after a few years, even with cruddy soil, you can probably get to that point where it's friable, where you don't have to to break it up every year. Um, and what I do like is that, you know, if you are doing cover crops, um, make sure that you work with cover crops that die back, either by cutting or by um, having our, our cold come, uh, die, uh, kill them back, um, so that you can just leave them on top of the soil and let them break down and work into the soil, um, eventually just through natural processes. So last year I did a started a worm bin and it's the first time I've put some of the castings in the soil and that seems like it would really be compatible compatible with no-till because the idea is the good whatever growth in the soil and not turning it over but what a difference in my garden huge mm -hmm. difference yeah any any organic matter like those castings is really um, helpful so worm castings aged manure compost um, I do, I would say that um, with manures, you do want to apply them appropriately in, in relation to when you're going to be growing edible crops um, for food safety reasons. So fall is a really great time to be applying manures if there's any question of how composted they are. Um, even aged manures at horse barns may not be fully composted enough for food safety purposes. Um, so again, when you're cleaning out your gardens, um, put down that, that manure in the in the fall and then that's one less chore that you have to do in in the springtime anyway so thank you yeah this is my uh, this is my first time to uh, use raised beds for zucchini and uh, tomatoes uh, how many plants can you put in a four by four uh, raised bed for either tomatoes or zucchini oh that's an awesome question because overcrowding is one of the number one things that i i see folks oh kind of do you know i hate to say do wrong but you know they people get really enthusiastic about um spacing and so um and and oftentimes over plant so um there's a great book um and series of books i believe now and about square foot gardening and so you can actually go by what the recommendations are there to some degree one caveat is that um if you're planting different crops mm -hmm. in a single raised bed, just keep in mind the overall size of the neighboring crops. Um, and, and if you've got a whole bunch, if you've got a few raised beds, maybe do your larger crops in one bed and your lower stature crops in the other. Because like, say for example, you've got a zucchini plant that would be the like one square foot is what you would wanna give that one single plant, which at the beginning of the season doesn't seem like you know, it looks like you could probably crowd in a few more, but you really want to give at least that one foot for that particular plant. Um, and then you have carrots right nearby. That zucchini plant will probably crowd out those carrots too much for you to get a really good yield on those carrots. And same with beets or something like that. They'll get crowded out by those 
bully plants is what I call them. Same with broccoli. Broccoli is notorious for kind of overcrowding its neighbors, even if you do give it that one square foot, which is recommended. Um, tomatoes are shocking. They usually, a two by two um, square foot area um, is really what you want to do. Four square feet actually is what you want for a tomato. So again, if you look at that young tomato seedling and you look at how big that area is, it's so tempting to squeeze in another two or three plants. Um, you can underplant it with like a short season crop like radish and lettuce or spinach. And um, those will come in and be ready to harvest before the plant gets overwhelmingly big. And so you can maximize your use of your space that way. Um, but really avoid overcrowding because it doesn't help things out and improve your yield overall. Mm -hmm. 